Okay, so hi everybody. Um, I hope everybody's well. Uh, so welcome back to Quarantine Thermo. We're on the fifth session already. Um, so today we've got a very uh, special um, speaker, and that's Rani Koslov, uh, who's one of the founding fathers of the field of quantum thermodynamics, but he's done many other things that. Um, so Rani is live from Jerusalem. He tells me t life is good in Jerusalem, although he's restricted to 100 meters radius, but uh, what can you do? Um, we're all in the same boat. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Ronnie, and he's going to talk about fast route determinization and the quantum signature in the Carnot cycle. Ronnie, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John. And this is uh, really great that you keep us busy here when we're uh, stuck at home. And what I want to tell you today about is uh, recent work that we have done here together with two uh, graduate students. One is Wei uh, Dan and the other is Andel Kubalina. And you can say that this uh, work started in uh, Santa Barbara uh, almost two years ago. And since then, we, I, I think we covered a lot of ground, which I would be happy to tell you. Before I do that, I just want to show you uh, Jerusalem today. This is, I'm sitting on my porch and uh, it's a nice sunny day and things look really bright and nice. So this is for everybody to, for a bright future. So here's a summary if you want to go back and to follow. So we wrote five papers, which is quite a lot you could think in two years, which are related to, uh, it's all started in Santa Barbara which will cover uh, the topics I want to talk about. So this is for later, it's your spare time now, which you have a lot, you can read these papers. So let's uh, start. And I'm going to start with Sadi Karno. And uh, he taught us a very important lesson. And the lesson that I say is learning from example. You take one example, in this case, the Carnot engine, and you generalize out of that. And you can reach to uh, extremely important principles. And this is out of his book. And we can see here that uh, the efficiency depends only on the temperature of the two uh, sources. This uh, is amazing that uh, Carnot reached to this conclusion without even the good definition of energy or heat or work or anything like that. And the other point is, if you read this book, which I read with great amazement, you see it's, it's very analytical. And he gets to the conclusion that this engine is universal. It's not only good for this specific example, it's an example for everything. So this is a kind of a line that I want to follow. So let's see what we can do about it. And the whole theme, I would say, of uh, modern thermodynamics is that there's this dilemma between power and efficiency. And people who heard my talk saw this uh, slide before. I changed the car to the left to, um, uh, for Italy. And uh, so I would say a twist on this, as you can say, here is a trade-off between power and efficiency. You can add another twist to it. You can make it a triangle and talk about fluctuations, which is what we heard in previous talks. So this is the dilemma. And let's see how we can solve it for the uh, kernel engine. So here's our kernel cycle in the way I like to think about it. I have here the, you can say the isotherms, the cold isotherms, the hot isotherm. And we ha it's a four-stroke engine. And we can say we, I go on this hot isotherm. I have a, a diabetic stroke that I connect to the cold one. I go on the cold one and I close the cycle with another adiabatic stroke. And... The way to think about it is this is a propagator, and it's a product of four propagators, each one for each stroke. 
And this connects us to uh, ideas, we can say, if we want to think about how a quantum computer, it works in the same way. But here we have four-stroke engine, which is then cyclic. And then I can think about the propagator of the cycle. And when I want to analyze it, I look for the fixed point of this uh, propagator. So <clears throat> this is the frame that we're going to use. We know the efficiency here is this uh, term here that I have here. And what we're interested in here is to find shortcuts to find the protocol that does this engine in the way that we can get, let's say, optimize the power that we can get out of this engine. And you can see small turtles here on the adiabats and assume that we can do shortcuts for the adiabatic moves. And if you want to look at it, you can read the paper of John Gould who did it for the auto cycle. So we can have shortcuts on these directions, but we're interested in short, short, shortcuts on the isotherms, which hasn't been done before. So this is really the issue that I want to deal with now. So let's see how this goes. Ronnie, I have to Ronnie, I have to I have to interrupt you there for two seconds. Um, there yeah. seemed to be there seemed to be a small technical glitch. Let me just make sure that everything is fine. Um, everything seems to be fine again, so you can continue. Apologies for that, Ronnie. It just uh, I have to I have to keep a track of it. It's just some glitch. You can go that ahead. Could be, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, but now my computer got stuck. Yeah, I mean, it might be on your side and not on mine, but, uh... Okay, okay I'll go back to full screen. See? Yeah, everything looks fine, but if you go to full screen, if you go back, go back, go back a slide. You're on, yeah, perfect, you're okay, go ahead. Okay, okay, so we're fine. I apologize for that, but that's life. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about the kernel cycle, and basically, this week we already heard about it. Here's a Marty's talk about optical finite time kernel cycle. So it's nice to continue from a place where he stopped. So here is the cycle. You can see that his Marty's kernel cycle is similar to mine, and he analyzed it from a point of view of small dissipation. And this is where I want to have a large dissipation. That's where we're going to continue in a way from what he told us on Tuesday. So I started to work on this, you can say, many years ago with Eitan Geva, which was a graduate student at that time. And we looked, you can see here at this paper, and a kernel engine with a working medium, which is a, a spin half or a qubit, you would call it today. And we looked at what I would call an endo-reversible idea that was leading to what's called Curzon Alborn efficiency. So you can see the internal temperature of my kernel engine is smaller than the bath temperature, and that's why I have finite heat transport, and you can say the source of irreversibility in this engine is finite heat transport, and this is the cycle that we analyzed in this paper. And you can see we used uh, Lindblad equations to do the dynamics, but there's one important point here. There's no coherence considered here. Everything is on the energy shell, so you could call this today a stochastic uh, description, because all what I have to know is the energy, in a way, in the four points of these of the cycle, and I know everything. So, uh, what happened after that, that Peter Solomon, which I have his picture here to the right, uh, came and visited me in Jerusalem, and we started to work on the auto engine. And we basically forgot about the kernel engine. And the reason we did it was partly technical, because we didn't know how to treat the isotherms. And uh, so the auto engine, you can say the 
when you do thermalization, you're in constant Hamiltonian, and then it's easy to build your master equation. So Peter Solomon came again to Jerusalem and visited me and said, okay, why don't you do kernel cycle? So I started to scratch my head and I said, okay, maybe we, it's time to do it again. And it took about four years. So this is where we are. And what is the problem? The problem in the Carnot cycle is the isotherms. We're changing our Hamiltonian while we're coupled to the bath, which means that our equations of motion that we have to solve are complicated by the dynamics. And this is what we have to treat. So here we're going back to the Carnot cycle's isotherms. Where does this trouble come from? It comes from the coherence. And the coherence, you can say the source of it is that the Hamiltonian doesn't commute with itself at different times. So a situation like that, which I think is generic, then if you move your Hamiltonian, you change it fast, you're going to generate coherence. And then you have to deal with this somehow. So you have two things that happen. First of all, the equations of motion have to change, and then you have to know how to deal with the coherence that's generated if you move your Hamiltonian too fast. So what do we want to do in the isotherms? We want to change our state, change our Hamiltonian, and stay in constant temperature. And if we want shortcuts, it's sufficient that we do it at the endpoints of our cycle. So, this is the protocol. We're changing the system Hamiltonian in, from an initial to a final state. And what has happened, where does the problem come? That we know how to apply this protocol directly, so we know how the Hamiltonian changes and the dynamic change. But if we change the Hamiltonian, also the dissipation has to change with it. So this is really the challenge that we have to solve. Rani, so let's Rani see. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to yeah. interrupt you. I'm sorry about this. Do you, can you connect possibly to, um, to, a, to another machine there? It's just a little bit on, uh, it's a little, or maybe I can even move this thing a little bit. Um, it's just a little bit unstable. Okay. That's how it works. Yeah. Okay. Now, so Ronnie, you share the screen again, and maybe go back a slide and. Um... Wait a minute. Okay. Here I am. When, when in doubt, reset. <laughs> I hope you had a cup of coffee in the meantime. <laughs> okay, so Ronnie, take it away again. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'll continue from this point. Our, what we have to deal with is the isotherm and the kernel cycle. And I have this image. The trouble is we are, have to do driving through honey. So think about it. We are not doing free driving. We're driving while we're in contact with the bath. So... This is the task we have to solve. We want to find a protocol that changes the Hamiltonian from an initial to the final state, and initially has the temperature of the bath, and the final step, it also has the temperature of the bath. In the middle, we allow ourselves freedom. If we would be adiabatic, in a way we would follow the temperature of the bath all the time, and our density operator will look like that. So this is the problem we have. And the problem comes because if we change the Hamiltonian, we change also the dissipation. So we can't do one without the other. So this is the challenge which we have to solve, and this is what we set to do. So here is, uh, you can say, our plan. And we found out it's quite a, you can say, involved problems. There's three sides to it. One is to solve the free driven dynamics. We need that, as we'll see, to get the driven master equation. So we need the free, 
dynamics to get the master equation. And then it also becomes a problem of quantum control. We want to control a quantum process, and then the question is, how do you uh, do that? And that's in a way where interference and coherence gets involved in this story. So this is the, you can say the whole story is in set in the slide, and now we'll try to break it into a few pieces, and I'll give you a few hints about progress that we did on these issues. So let's start with the free dynamics. So we have to, if I have a system coupled to a path and I want to get the Lindblad equation, I have to first solve for the free dynamics. So we do that in Louisville space in an operator base. And if I write Heisenberg equations of motion, this is what I get. And the Usual problem when I have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, that the Hamiltonian doesn't commute with itself at different times. And I have this something that always is hiding in many papers, which you call time ordering, which involves, if you in one case, an infinite series or something that you have to do about it. And now we, are, in a way, have to solve this problem of time ordering. So I won't give a general solution. But let's try to find a particular solution for this time ordering. And the idea is let's try to find a time-dependent transformation of my operator basis to a new basis. So if I do that, again, I can write the equations of motion. I just get this extra term because it has explicit time dependence. And I get this, if I write it in a matrix form, I get it like that. The change in this vector of operators is this matrix times this vector of operators. And again, I'm faced with this time ordering problem on this matrix M. So <clears throat> now, what can we do about that? I didn't really solve the problem. I just made it more complicated. But if we're lucky, and I'll tell you in a minute, we can always be lucky. We can find a time-dependent uh, transformation that will help us to solve this problem, which is this slide here. And the question is, if I can take this matrix and break it to two diagonalizing matrices which are time-independent and put all the time-dependence in this diagonal part and the eigenvalues here, then in a way, I solved the problem. I did a separation of time scales. I have all my fast time scales are sitting here in the diagonal. And the slow, you can say, terms, in, which I'll treat in a minute, are hiding in these diagonalizing matrices. So if I can find a transformation that will bring me to this form, then I'm in good shape. I can solve the dynamics. And the answer is, it's always possible to find a solution like that, but it's not, this theorem is not constructive. In a way, we have to guess it. And this is, I think, nice. For problems, you have to understand them, and then you can guess a transformation that will bring it to this form. <clears throat> now, if we can do this, then you can say, I diagonalized my problem in a certain way, and I can find what we call the next, the eigenoperators, which are these Fs here over here. And the solution of the dynamics can be written in terms of these eigenoperators and expansion coefficients. And these eigenoperators come with a phase, which is the development in time. So. We used, I would say, basic linear algebra in Hilbert space, in Louisville space in this case. And we, if we can find a solution like that, we put all the problem into finding these eigenoperators, which I call them FK here, which will solve, solve my problem. Now, these eigenoperators become very important in understanding the free dynamics. Some of them have eigenvalues zero, and then they become time-dependent constants of motion, which is something useful to have. 
and the ones that are not time that are time explicitly time dependent will become the Lindblad jump operators in the master equation. So this tells us why solving the free dynamics is crucial in making progress in this problem. So <clears throat> the next step after that, it, since I found a particular protocol, let's say I want to deviate a little bit from this protocol, we can use now ideas that come from adiabatic dynamics and we can change our protocol. So these are slow dynamics. These chi's here are slow dynamics and we get what we call an inertial parameter, which is equivalent to the adiabatic parameter when we go from adiabatic. But now we're not slow. But you can say the fast time scales are taken care of, and then our protocol, we take care of the slow time scale, and all what we have to obey is this inertial parameter has to be small. So in a way, this looks very abstract. And to just get a hint, how does this look? Let's take some examples, and that will, be, I hope, will become more clear. So here is, a, I would say, uh, an example that has been uh, beaten to to death almost, and which is the three-level system where the Hamiltonian is all time dependent. So I have, you can say, three levels like that. I have a lambda system, or I have them consecutive, whatever you want in a three-level system, any configuration you want. And the simple case, I just couple them. I couple one, let's say, to, to two and two to three, which would be written like that. And all these couplings are time, explicitly time-dependent. So I want to solve the dynamics driven by this type of Hamiltonian. And what we can do, as I said, what we need is to go from our, a basis of the three by three uh, algebra, which we uh, use. Uh, uh, the al we, we want to go to a time dependent basis and we use this S matrix here as our transformation to a time dependent basis. And then what we find out here, here's our M matrix, it becomes constant. So we can use our tricks, we can diagonalize it, we can find its eigenvalues. And what these parameters here are, here they're sitting down below, we have chi1 and chi2, and there are a certain combinations of these coefficients in the Hamiltonian. So to make this matrix constant, these parameters have to be small, they have to be uh, constant. But they can change a little bit, and that's why what we call inertial. So we can solve, you can say, the dynamics of this type of Hamiltonian. We can even have it even more complicated. I have this Hamiltonian here where everything is connected to everything. And here on the right, you can see the spectrum of uh, this Hamiltonian, this in the way the Louisville uh, operator of this Hamiltonian and you can see it's a very complicated spectrum but it's constant I can deal with it and if I want to change a little bit here's this yellow streak here I change my Hamiltonian I can follow the dynamics here and this would be called an inertial solution that I use it for this uh, type of dynamics so <clears throat> This is one example. We'll have some other examples to, to look at this. And if we look at stir up, here is the two people who are famous for stir up. One is uh, Joseph Eberly, and the other is Klaus uh, Bergman. And what is stir up? Stir up is, is a way to treat the lambda system and to move all population from that uh, ground state, let's say, to another state through an intermediate state. And if you want to think about stir up from the point of view of the inertial theorem, what you look for is a time dependent constant of motion. What is a time dependent constant of motion? It's an operator that you can see its dynamics. It's explicitly time dependence, but you can say it's commutator with a Hamiltonian plus its explicit dynamics. It doesn't change in time. So 
initially its expectation value and its final expectation value should be the same. And for Stira, this is the C is this time dependent constant of motion, which we can write the density operator also in terms of this uh, constant of motion. And then we can understand just by looking at it, why a counterintuitive uh, dynamics works for uh, stirrup. What means you want to change the population from here to here. So you first turn on beta and then you turn on alpha, which is the opposite, the counterintuitive uh, direction. And in the middle, you generate coherence between these states, but eventually, if one of these coefficients is, is zero, you just do population transfer. So what we can do here, once we understand that we can find shortcuts to stirrup, which will have the same property as stirrup of stability, but they'll just be uh, much faster. But this idea of time-dependent constants of motion also tells us that we can have kind of a recipe to find shortcuts for other types of uh, adiabatic, what I would call a adiabatic motion. So this was a, a glimpse of what we can do with the inertial uh, theorem. And now let's go to what we designed it for, is to find a non-adiabatic master equation. And you can say from the beginning we want it to be in Lindblad form. Here I have a picture of Lindblad here on the right. And this is to be consistent with thermodynamics. So we, we want to build these master equations according to what I would call Davis uh, construction. And if we do that, we are assured that our equations are at least consistent with thermodynamics and we can use them to analyze the Carnot engine, for example. So we want them to be in this form, but the difference is that all these operators are explicitly time dependent. So this is what we expect to get. So let's see how we get this. So the first step that we need in deriving the master equation, we start from a general Hamiltonian of a system and bath and an interaction. And we can write the interaction like this. And the first step is always going to the interaction representation with respect to the free dynamics of the system and bath. And since our free dynamics of the bath is driven, we have to basically solve the problem of free dynamics, but I just told you that we can do that. So then the standard approach is you go to second order perturbation theory, you get this uh, an interaction representation, you get this uh, double commutator in this convolution form, and I go through standard uh, expressions, but just to understand what are these Lindblad uh, jump operators that we'll have, if the evolution is with a static Hamiltonian, we know that the Lindblad jump operators are basically transitions from one state to another, with the Bohr frequency hiding here. So this is what will appear in, in the Lindblad uh, uh, jump operators. And the way to think about it, once we have these uh, transitions, we can expand the system path operator and the interaction representation using these, what will be called, called before these F operators, which you can think about them as eigen operators of the evolution. Now, if we have a driven system, we'll do the same. You can say the driving, we have modified it by this explicit time dependence here. And what we're looking is for eigen operators of the evolution. And if we can solve the inertial problem, we have them. And this is the next step after that will be to expand the system path coupling using these eigen operators. And then eventually they'll become the Lindblad jump operators in our master equation.
So <clears throat> there's a lot of t uh, technical, I would say. Uh, it's not difficult. It's just a lot of uh, flack that you have to go through. But eventually, we get an equation of motion which looks like that, which has this Lindblad form. And here I wrote it already in interaction representation, which is simpler. And these Fs here are these eigen operators of my free evolution. And you get a modified frequency and so on, the Bohr frequency, which I'll talk about it in a minute. So the best thing to understand this is again through an example. Let's take a driven harmonic oscillator. So I only drive, you can say, the potential part of my harmonic oscillator, so the kinetic energy doesn't commute with the potential energy. So this is a standard problem of driving as we described it. And the harmonic oscillator has an algebra of six operators that I have to deal with, which are, you can say, the depends how you want to look at them. We choose them as to be the Hamiltonian, the Lagrangian, the system position momentum correlator, you can say the position and the momentum, which are scaled. So we have a set of six operators, and now we can solve the free dynamics of this system, these six operators, and we can get again a constant matrix, which is a function of one parameter here, which is our inertial parameter, which in this case, it becomes omega dot divided by omega squared. So we're in a position that now we can construct out of this our master equation, which I'll do the next uh, step. So this is a master equation that I get. I'm still in the interaction representation. And if you look at it, it looks very familiar because this would just be the master equation of the harmonic oscillator. but the definition of these jump operators, this B, which we would have in the, in the standard master equation, has changed a little bit. It's another linear combination of Q and P, which you can say depends on this mu and this kappa, which are all defined here. So what happens is that my master equation becomes modified due to the driving and it becomes indirectly through these uh, coefficients that I have here that define these jump operators. Now remember that in this equation I'm in the interaction representation, so I have another explicit time dependence when I go back to the normal representation. So I have this adiabatic parameter here, mu omega dot divided by omega square, I have built in detailed balance, which assures me that I get the correct thermodynamics, but I have a modified frequency or a scaled frequency and it's scaled by this kappa. So it's not the frequency of the harmonic oscillator, it's scaled by this kappa, which means that the frequency that the bath sees is smaller than the frequency of my oscillator. So this is what we get out of it. And if you compare that to what you would get from a diabetic solution, a diabetic solution says that you take the instantaneous Hamiltonian and then define the jump operators from that. So this is work that has been done by Danny Lidao in 2012, and you can compare it to what we have. And we see that there is a Doppler change in frequency. So the frequency that the bath sees for detailed balance is smaller. So you get slower down of the relaxation rate. And I would say the most important point here is that you get mixing of energy and coherence. And this is a very important point because the standard master equation for static Hamiltonian doesn't mix coherence and population which means that in many cases I don't have to worry about coherence at all. If I'm only interested in energy, I don't have to deal with it. But in this case, once I drive, I mix energy and coherence, and you can't get away with it that simply. And the point is that since we're driving, we're driving 
towards a direction which I call instantaneous attractor. I don't reach steady state because my target is moving all the time. I move towards a fixed point which is moving, so that's what we call it instantaneous attractor. And let's see how this works. So now go, going back, remembering that we want to think about the Carnot cycle, the isotherms. So I want to change from this density operator to this density operator, changing my Hamiltonian. This is what we had before. And this involves entropy change. It's not a unitary evolution. It's a non-unitary evolution that I'm interested in. So now we're faced with the challenge of a protocol, how to solve these equations to do fast isothermal strokes. So we want shortcuts to isothermal strokes, and the question is how to do that. So the first thing is to get the equation, in which I wrote it in a more simple way with these B operators that we have here. And the, now I have to solve this equation. So the question is how to do that. And we're going to use an idea that came from, you can say, Oppenheim in 64, which is called canonical invariance. And we think that our density operator is in a general canonical form. But you can see it's, this is a squeezed, a squeezed uh, canonical form. It's not the uh, standard one. So that's why it's called a generalized canonical form. And so once we put our density operator in this form, then it becomes a problem of parameters in the way this generalized inverse temperature and the squeezing parameter. So we stick this form into our equation, and we get equations of motion for our parameters, beta and gamma here. And <clears throat> we assume that in our initial state is thermal. Then we can see that the second equation I don't have to solve, and I basically have to solve only one equation for my inverse temperature. So it's a nonlinear equation, doesn't look too sympathetic, but still we'll see that we can deal with this uh, equation for the inverse temperature, or generalized inverse temperature, it's better to see. So now we have how we're going to engineer a specific solution. So we start up here, we guess a form, this generalized canonical form, out of that, we get an equation of motion for our inverse temperature in gamma. We assume initial conditions such that this gamma is initially zero, so we only have to deal with this beta. So we have boundary conditions for our inverse temperature that are depend on, you can say, on the frequency in the beginning and the frequency in the end. From that, we do change of variables, and we define the variable y is e to the power of beta, and assume a polynomial, a fifth order polynomial for this uh, variable, which would fit our boundary conditions. So this is how we, in a way, engineer the solution with a scale time. From this we get, you can say, beta is a function of time. And from beta as a function of time, we can go back and get alpha as a function of time. And if we get alpha as a function of time, we can get omega, or oscillator frequency as a function of time. So you can see the chain of events goes like that, from the density operator to the equation for the parameter. We integrate it, we get alpha, or scaled uh, frequency, and we get the frequency, which is our control parameter in our equation of motion. So this we can do, and if we do that, we can get a protocol for a shortcut for isothermal motion. So here's examples of two protocols, one for expansion and one for compression. In expansion, we reduce our frequency, and in compression, we increase our frequency. So let's say, in this example of expansion, we start with a frequency of 2, 
and reach a frequency of one. And this red is our protocol. So we, you can see that we undershoot. And the point is that in the beginning and in, in the end, our protocol is designed to be exactly in equilibrium. So we start in equilibrium, we end in equilibrium, and in the middle, we generate a lot of coherence. And this we can see in the picture below, which is the trajectory of our solution, where we have three variables, the Hamiltonian, the system, the position momentum correlator, and the Lagrangian. So these should be zeros if we're in equilibrium. So these are these two green points. So we start here and end here. But in the middle, we generate a lot of coherence. We play in this, you can say, the space of three variables. So we start here, we play around, and then we land here. So in the middle, we're not in equilibrium at all, and we generate a lot of coherence. Now, all the solution obeys our inertial theorem, so we know it's uh, correct, so that's how we can uh, find it. Now, an alternative, just for comparison, is this blue line, which is a quench, which, how would you reach equilibrium? You start from your initial Hamiltonian, change your frequency at once, and that's just weight. And then you approach exponentially this point. And the green line is a diabetic solution, which would take infinite amount of time. So what we show here that we can go from this point to this point at finite time and get extremely high fidelity, which I'll show you in a minute. And for compression, it's a similar story. We overshoot quite a lot. You can say we start with a frequency of one and we go to a frequency almost of seven and then go back to a frequency of two. So you can see all this excursion and this uh, space here, we generate a lot of coherence. And then you should, you can think, why does this protocol work? Why can I do things much faster than a quench? You, could, you would think that a quench would work fine. You just change your Hamiltonian from the initial to the final state and wait naturally until you reach equilibrium. The reason you're better because if you wait for a quench, initially you relax fast, but then you go to the eigenvalues of, the, you can say, of the Louisvillian that are slow. So it takes longer and longer until you're basically, the time you reach equilibrium goes to the smallest eigenvalue in your Louisvillian. What happens in this protocol, by generating coherence, you're always very far from equilibrium. And you could think about it, that the rate of approaching equilibrium goes as the distance from equilibrium. So I'm very far from equilibrium, that's why I'm very fast, which means that my relaxation to the final state is fast. And then what you do, you change coherence into energy and you land on the point that you want. So this is how this protocol can do things much faster than just doing a quench, waiting, and going on. This is just showing fidelity. You can, for this example, you get three orders of magnitude improvement in time or fidelity. And, and another question is, how much does it cost? And it costs in a thermodynamic sense. I have to put work into doing that. So I can define efficiency the amount of work relative to the ideal amount of work which would be defined by the diabetic solution, and I can look at the efficiency of this protocol for expansion or compression, and you can see that if I cut my time and make it shorter, as expected, the efficiency goes down. What does it mean? That I have to invest more work into driving my system fast, then I would do it adiabatic. But then what I gain is I can do things uh, fast. So remember that when we combine all these ideas into our kernel engine. So this is just to compare to cost of shortcuts. So if we have adiabatic shortcuts, what do we have? 
we change the energy, but we don't uh, change coherence. The initial coherence and the final coherence is zero. So that's what's written here. L is zero, C is zero. This means that the coherence is zero. So shortcut to adiabaticity, what we do, we want to start on the energy shell and end on the energy shell, and in the middle we can generate coherence. So what we do, we cache on the coherence at the end and convert this coherence back to energy, and that's why we can work much faster in doing a diabetic drive. So it's a shortcut to adiabatic. We're not adiabatic all the time. We are on the energy shell in the middle and in the end. Now, there is no change in the entropy of the system. So this is a unitary process. And you can say that there is, you invest energy into it, but you can get this energy out. So I consider a type of process like that, like a catalysis. I have to invest, but I can get it out. If we compare this to shortcut to equilibrium, we have, again, we change our energy. In the beginning and the end, we don't change our coherence, but there is an entropy change. And so our coherence is dissipated, and this is what I would call quantum friction. So the speed up cost work in entropy production. It's not neutral from a thermodynamic point of view. Okay, so once we understood this uh, example, we said, okay, now we have a protocol for quantum control of open systems, which has been an open problem for a while. So we can say this, it's the same standard construction. I can only control my system but I'm coupled to the bath. So I don't have any direct, in this game, I don't have any direct control of the bath, I'm coupled to it. So the system dynamics is governed by the Louisville von Neumann equation with a dissipator. And what we could ask is in control three questions. First, is it controllable? And the second question, can I find constructive mechanisms of control? And the third question is how to find optimal control and to compare it to quantum speed limits. So we solved these two first problems. The third problem is still uh, open, but we're working on that. So Let's think about control tasks. In this, and in this example, we use the qubit, and uh, we can think about the first task transforming between two equilibrium states with different Hamiltonians. This is what we needed for a kernel. But we could also think about transformation between an initial non-equilibrium state to an equilibrium state accompanied by a change in the Hamiltonian. So this we also can find a solution. And the third one is the most interesting one. We can transform to a final state which is colder than the bath, which is, here is a effective temperature of my system, and you can see that this one of these protocols that I choose is basically cooling. I'm taking my qubit, I'm doing some focus, focus driving, and I find myself at the end of the process that my qubit is colder than the bath. So we could think a little bit, am I violating any laws of thermodynamics? And the truth is not. You can think about it in another way. I have a qubit and I have a bath and I have a driving, and what I'm doing is a refrigerator. I'm using my driving to take entropy out of my system and pouring it into the bath. So from a thermodynamic point of view, it's legitimate. But what it shows here that I can find a protocol that does that. So I reach this state. I'm all the time connected to the bath. If I would disconnect it for the bath at this point here, I would get a cold cube, colder than when I started. If I still connect it to the bath at this point, eventually I'm going to uh, quench back to the bath naturally. 
And you can see that all these processes here I plotted, the entropy production, are strongly irreversible. So <clears throat> this is from the control perspective. Okay, something happened here. I got stuck. Okay, now I'm back. Okay. So now let's see what are the control uh, protocols that we have. Here is our Hamiltonian of our qubit. I'm changing two parameters here, the frequency of omega and this coupling epsilon here. And what I want to show you that I can change purity. So if you look at this ball, Pure states are at the surface of the ball, and everything inside is mixed state, and the point in the middle is a completely mixed state. So I can find a protocol that increases purity, the one here that starts red and goes blue, that's a cooling protocol, and I can find another protocol that decreases purity, starts from here and goes to here, so what's interesting about these protocols, if you think about it, they are non-unitary. There's no unitary evolution that can lead to protocols like that. Okay, so that was uh, an excursion to co control of open systems. And now we're back to, you can say, our motivation, shortcuts to four-stroke uh, Cognos cycle. So here's... Again, the Carnot cycle plotted in a slightly different way. Here's the internal energy divided by uh, omega. And uh, what, what we can see, we have two adiabats, which in this case here is this green one and this purple one, which we have work. And we have two isotherms. Here's the red isotherm and here's the cold isotherm. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for shortcuts. You can see the four corners are set. They're set as the Carnot engine. And we want to find protocols that do these moves faster than a diabetic motion. Now we assume already that we know how to do shortcuts for the diabetic motion, so we're not dealing with that. This is the protocols that we're using. But for the isotherms, we're going to look for shortcuts. So here's again this Carnot cycle that we're looking for the fixed point of the cycle. And here are certain examples. We can solve it for different uh, cycle time. And this is the standard plot that you look at engines. You can see the efficiency divided by Carnot efficiency and the power divided by the maximum power. And this red line is this result of the shortcuts that I just described, that we had shortcuts on the isotherms and shortcuts on the adiabats. And this point here, this cyan line uh, arrow here tells us the maximum power that we can get out of this engine. And the efficiency at maximum power is not exactly Coors and Alborn, but it's not very far from there. It doesn't have to be there. So this is this engine that I just described. Now, if we look at it in a different way, here's the efficiency divided by the Carnot efficiency relative to the cycle time. We look at this red line, and we see that we sh when we start to shorten our cycle time, eventually we stop to be an engine, and there is a minimum cycle time. Why is that? Because I have to invest work into making driving it faster. So eventually I invest so much work that I don't get anything out of this engine. So that's why this cycle ends here, and we get the minimum cycle time. But now look at this cycle. I have another cycle here, which is this the purple one, that they can go to very short cycle times. What is this uh, cycle that I can basically beat this idea and I can go to very sh short cycle times? And this is what I want to show now, but I'm stuck. What 
what happened. So, Ronnie, I think that's nothing to do with us. The stream is perfect. I think it's maybe on your side. Okay, it did move. Something happened. Yeah, okay, it did move. Yeah. Okay, so now we have cycles which I call global. And the idea about the global cycle is that I'm going to keep the coherence all the time. In the previous cycles, in the four corners, you can say here I plot the cycle as entropy as a function of omega, my frequency. So the previous cycle at these four corners, I had zero coherence. So all what I was doing, I was generating coherence, cashing on it at the end of the cycle of the stroke, not cycle. I have no coherence. So I'm using the coherence just to generate shortcuts. But I can be global. I can keep coherence all along. I can have a cycle that never loses its coherence. And these are the cycles that are shown here uh, to the left. So if you look at this plot, I have energy H in this direction. L and C are coherences. And you can see I cycle uh, very much, and then there is a small black line which I can see, and you probably could hear, you can see it better here. This is the zero coherence line. I never reached this point in this cycle. And here is another cycle that we saw before that you can see. I start with zero coherence, and I'm on this black line at four points. These are the four corners. So this is the difference between a cycle that has global coherence and a cycle that has only local coherence. So a cycle that keeps global coherence can have a very short cycle time. This is what I want to show you now. So again, I'm stuck, but I don't know. Yeah, this should be on your side, Ronnie. It's 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 just uh, it's your laptop. I don't know. It's well, okay. Yeah, it sometimes moves. Yeah. So it moved. So here is this idea that came from work with Ram Ustin, which is quantum equivalence that if we think about cycles that have a very short cycle time or action you can say a four stroke cycle will be equivalent to a continuous cycle and this cycle that works at very short cycle time has to work on coherence so this is this limit of very short cycle time and what i'm showing you is just uh, an example of a cycle like that and here I'm plotting coherence as a function of time, and you can see that the cycle coherence never goes to zero, and the shortcut cycle at four corners, you can see, reaches zero, and I'm just keeping the coherence on the strokes. So this is, I would say, a cycle that's purely quantum, because it operates on coherence, and if you dissipate it, which I'm not showing you here, it will stop to work. Or another way to think about it, if you have an engine like that that works on coherence, and you look at it, it will stop, because you measure it, you'll ruin the coherence. If you measure energy, for example, this engine will stop to work. Okay, so now, Perfect. Yeah. So now I'm uh, ready to summarize for you. I hope you bear with me this uh, discussion. So we did a long voyage, so maybe too much for uh, Friday afternoon, but hopefully you'll have a good glass of wine later and you'll <laughs> dissipate it. <laughs> so we went through many topics that were all related to uh, a Carnot engine working far from equilibrium. So we had to develop an anadiabatic master equation. F for To do that, we had to develop an inertial approach, an inertial theorem and how to solve free dynamics. And then we found shortcuts that are good when you have entropy changes. And eventually we reached to a finite time uh, kernel cycle. So this is what I wanted to tell you uh, this afternoon, and I hope you can ask questions or whatever.
Great, Ronnie. Thanks a lot. That was a great talk. Um, so uh, I just want to apologize, people, to, for the technical issues we had at the start. But actually, after we reset everything, it worked absolutely perfectly. So we know in the future to reset everything before the speaker starts. So if in doubt, reset everything. So thanks a lot, Ronnie. There was a couple of questions um, during the talk, and I'll, I'll, I'll start off with them. So the first question comes from Sabrina Maniscalco in Turku, uh, in Finland. And Sabrina asks uh, uh, the following question, um, which is an interesting one. Uh, I, was, I was thinking something similar myself. In the microscopic derivation of the master equation, to reach Lindblad form, one needs to make approximations regarding several time scales involved in the dynamics, typically. Um, yeah. If the system is time dependent, this introduces another time scale, which should also be taken into account in order to guarantee the validity of the Markovian master equation. Isn't this a constraint in the temporal shape of the drive two uh, or its time scale? It is. So Sabrina is right. You can say that the fastest time scale in this case has to be the path. Otherwise, I don't have a Markovian description. So the driving has to be slower than the time scale of the path. So there is another restriction in, into that. So you can say eventually when you have, since we have a Markovian theory, when you become non-Markovian, I'll have to include the bath explicitly, and that's beyond the game that we played here. I see. I see. So another, uh, another question. Um, so thanks a lot for that answer, Ronnie. That's, that's fine. Um, I hope that's okay for Sabrina. Maybe Sabrina can let us know if that's okay. Um, uh, Barish, uh, from, from I think he's in, in Turkey, he asks, uh, any understanding why there is a difference between the cost of expansion and compression at fast driving times? Okay, this is a, a very interesting question that we thought about it, uh, and it goes like, like that. You can say expansion and compression is not the same. Because when you do expansion, you have to think, what are the limitations? So our limitations is we have to obey the inertial theorem. So the inertial theorem tells us that we, if we look at the eigenvalues of the Neuvillian operator, they can't be degenerate in the same way as the diabetic theorem breaks down when you have degeneracies. Now, when you do expansion, in a way, you re, you lower the gap. So this puts a limit on uh, the efficiency or what you can do. I see. Now, and when you do compression, you can really drive it strongly and have a lot more dissipation. So you're, you can overshoot more and still uh, be okay. So the, the, the two are not symmetric, the expansion and compression. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ronnie, again. I hope that's okay for Barish. Um, <laughs> A question coming in for Mark Mitchison, who works in, in our group in Dublin, but he's currently exiled in his, in his, in his hometown of London. Uh, so he says, thanks for a great talk. I have a question about heat currents. Do you use the Spahn framework to define entropy production? And if so, the expression for the heat current must look quite unusual because the instantaneous steady state is not related to the instantaneous Hamiltonian. How do you interpret this difference? Okay, so this is a, a very good point. So you can say the instantaneous uh, you approach includes coherence. So you can't count, you can't do the usual trick which you say uh, the heat is the entropy uh, times uh, the temperature of the bath. It, this just doesn't work. So what we did here, we we de we define we you use the power to and the conservation of energy to define and we we check that if we use phones definition it doesn't work so this is something we're analyzing and hopefully we'll we'll uh, write about it soon interesting okay thanks so ronnie the, so the standard definition it's the entropy production is always positive there's no question about that but the question is can you use the entropy production to get the heat out of it and the answer is no i see Thanks, Ronnie. That's 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 interesting. Definitely for future work, I guess, for you. Um, so a couple of more questions coming in. Um, Sina asks, 
the following question. He says, to implement a kernel cycle, we also need to find a way to switch on and off the coupling to the cold and hot paths. So as I see it, we may also need time-dependent coupling Hamiltonian. Can this also be formulated in your approach? Probably yes, but we haven't done that. Okay. So this is something... People have done that, but if you do, if you drive the coupling, you should uh, also change the Lindblad. So people uh, uh, have changed the coupling in a time-dependent way, but I don't think they did it consistently. Or at least I have to check that. I see. Thanks a lot. And so yeah, let's put it like that. We haven't done that yet, and I think with the same framework, you probably could do that. Interesting. Okay, so another question coming in from Marty, who gave uh, already gave a, a, a very nice talk here on Carnot cycles recently. So Marty says, "Hi Ronnie, thanks for the great talk. In this regime of fast cycles using shortcuts, uh, is it clear whether the Otto or Carnot cycle is better? That is power output for a given efficiency." Uh... What I haven't uh, compared. I don't know. So this is again another great research question. So you get lots of yeah. lots of papers coming it's up. A, it's a good it's a good question. I haven't thought about it really too. Please acknowledge quarantine thermo in the acknowledgements, Ronnie. That's all we ask. <laughs> yeah. the, the thing is that the, the Carnot and the Otto cycle, in a way, are, are different because the question is how do you compare properly? That's and the compression ratio in the auto engine is limited and the Carnot engine is not limited. So, and if you use the same compression ratio, you're at zero power. Right. So, so it's, it's a little subtle to yeah. do a fair comparison. Thanks, Ronnie. Guys, is there any more questions for Ronnie? Uh, we'll just wait a little bit here because there's a delay between when we're speaking and when I see them there. Anybody got other questions for Ronnie? Now's your chance to shine. <laughs> Okay, so Steve Campbell, who, who's here in Dublin, asks, uh, achieving the cooling, uh, you pay in terms of generating coherence, but maintaining the cool state, I guess, requires some sort of steady state current or housekeeping work. Is that right? Yeah. If you, okay. if you want to, keep, to stay there, you'd have to work from it. Yeah. I see. So there is, there is this housekeeping work. Okay, that's cool. Any other questions, guys? Now's your time. Or we leave Ronnie to his wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> keeping up keeping his keeping his immune system high, you know? Wine is the best. I have garlic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well there you go. I bought I bought fresh garlic in the market. This is the best. It keeps bats away and that's what we need now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think uh, I think we 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 are more or less done. We had a lot of nice questions. We had average of about well, we had roughly around a hundred people tuning in, um, so that's great. And uh, uh, apologies again for technical issues; they're inevitable in this type of a live uh, scenario. Um, so on Tuesday, I think, or early next week, we have Nicole Younger Halpern from Harvard giving a talk. And uh, please share the initiative with your colleagues and friends. And if you can, um, post it on your social media pages or whatever. See if we can get as many people as possible to tune in. Who knows how long, long we're in this crazy situation for. So it's always good to have a little bit of structure. So, Ronnie, thanks very much again. Bye. Hopefully we we, we read in, uh, we in uh, real time soon for a glass of wine together, all right? In Trieste, in Dublin, or in Jerusalem. Here, wait a minute. I'll show you. <laughs> So Ronnie's gone getting his booze. You see? Great. This is a very good bottle. Is it from? We'll have it together. I'll keep it for you. Okay, good. Is it? Is it? Is it the one that you told me that's made there in uh, in Israel? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, Ronnie. We'll see you later. Bye. 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 Bye.